All right, uh, let's get going. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick. Uh, this is my colleague, Amir. We both work at Akamai together. We are here today to talk to you about a journey that our teams have been on recently uh, at Akamai. Uh, we, uh, I work on a team called Impulse. We are a real user monitoring product at Akamai. We measure the performance impact uh, of visitors to websites uh, for our customers at Akamai. Amir, my colleague, and his team uh, work on a large-scale enterprise uh, internal Spark-based data warehouse. And recently, we went on a journey for uh, migrating Impulse, our product, off of Snowflake on the public uh, data warehouse and onto an internal data warehouse uh, at Akamai called Asgard. Uh, so the goal today is to share with you uh, why we did this migration, uh, some of the challenges that we found in the migration, some of the lessons learned, uh, and um, some of the good results that we found at the end. So with that, uh, let's get started. So as I said, uh, I work on a product called Impulse. It is a real user monitoring or RUM product at, uh, at Akamai. Uh, the goal of Impulse is performance analytics, web performance analytics. So we measure all of the user experiences uh, that are happening on web pages when they're one of our customers. Uh, and we compare these user experiences like the page load time, how long it took to show visuals, how many resources were fetched, et cetera. And we map these to business outcomes like uh, bounce rate, uh, session duration, uh, conversion rates, uh, money at, at the end of the day. Uh, so we have all these real-time dashboards. You can see some examples uh, of some of these dashboards uh, on the uh, slide here. Uh, and we're, we provide real-time aggregate analytics to our customers. We also have uh, the ability to show trace-level, debug-level information for every single experience that ever happens on any of these websites. Um, and so we have a lot of needs to uh, process and store and present data. So we need, we need a data warehouse. We need a way to store this data. We need a way for our dashboards to query this data. Um, we process over 2 billion beacons a day. A beacon is like a page load, essentially. Um, after somebody loads a page in Impulse or loads one of our customers' pages, we're monitoring it, we're measuring it. We beacon the data from the browser to the back end, and then we store it. Uh, we don't do any sampling. So by default, every single user experience is measured and monitored. And our customers then want to review this data on our dashboards. And so we provide some real-time aggregate dashboards that our customers can use to watch these experiences happening in real time. Uh, within five to 10 seconds of you visiting a website, your experience will be reflected on uh, in a dashboard. So we're processing terabytes of raw data a day, I think seven terabytes at the last uh, time we looked, um, and we need a place to store all this data. In addition, we also have what we call waterfall dashboards. These are trace level, debug level information that you can get about every single user experience, every single bit of information that we collected. And we're often collecting you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 kilobytes worth of data per page load um, about what happened on the page and the performance characteristics of it. Um, so we have another data pipeline that's storing more terabytes of raw logs a day, and our customers can access that data within five minutes. Most of our customers have about 13 months of data retention. Uh, and our data is uh, very dimensional. You know, we track over 50 different dimensions, everything from what country they were in, what browser they were on, what page type they visited, et cetera. And we store all of this in our large data warehouse. Uh, with our ret current retention policies, we have trillions of rows of data. We have petabytes of storage. And we need to be able to process this and query this data quickly and efficiently to present it into the dashboards that I showed you earlier. So, uh, you know, how do, how do we store all this data? Uh, Impulse has been around for a while, and we actually started out uh, as a startup called uh, Sosta uh, before we were acquired by Akamai. And we, we have been using the Snowflake public uh, data warehouse for a long time. We were one of Snowflake's first customers, one of their largest initial customers. And, uh, you know, we scaled with Snowflake. We were able to grow as a business, grow as a product, uh, because of the ability that Snowflake gave us to grow. Uh, and they learned a lot with us as well. Being one of their big customers, they kind of adapted to our needs initially. And this was years ago, right? But over time, uh, as you do, you kind of evaluate where you're spending your money and where your costs are going. Um, and Snowflake had become our largest cloud cost for storing all this data. Um, 
it, before we migrated off them, we were spending tens of millions of dollars a year. So a couple years ago, we tried to evaluate where we were and where we wanted to be, and if we wanted to save cost, one of the most obvious ways was to figure out an alternative to Snowflake. Uh, around that time, my colleague Amir and his team uh, has started working on an internal Spark-based data warehouse solution called Asgard, uh, and we committed Impulse to being one of the first Akamai products to move to this internal data warehouse. Of course, there was a lot of unique technical challenges with any migration, and I will go into those in a future slide. Um, but one of the goals of this migration was, of course, to save cost, uh, but also to have equal or better performance. And our, we ideally didn't want our customers to notice, like no downtime, migrate as smoothly as we can. So after we committed to doing this migration a couple years ago, we started down the path of figuring out how do we do this? How do we execute? Um, one of the big challenges that we have is we had years of assumptions built into Impulse using Snowflake. We had been built on top of Snowflake and they were you know, a critical component of our infrastructure. So we had to figure out all those places that we were depending on Snowflake specific things. Uh, Snowflake also made it very easy to throw money at the problem. Frankly, uh, as a startup and growing, uh, we didn't necessarily always look for the most optimal, optimized path. Sometimes we just threw money at it to grow. And that worked for us. That got us to where we are. So in order to migrate to Spark uh, and to Asgard, uh, we needed to come up with a comprehensive inventory of all the workloads that we had. What are we doing for the data, for the dashboards? What are we doing for internal cron processes? Who's all querying our data? Why, when, and how often? And so we came up with this large query inventory. We started looking at it and trying to figure out how do we migrate every single one of these workloads to this new internal uh, data warehouse that is being built. How do we transition them all to make sure that they're efficient uh, and they work good on Spark? That was one of our big challenges. And we had to work with uh, the Asgard team and Amir and many other people to make sure that these workloads were going to be successful on that platform. We also had a challenge of other teams were using our data. So we are the data source for other Akamai products. Uh, products at Akamai use the impulse data to better map uh, packets to the system. They use it to uh, build other products like uh, Akamai Adaptive Acceleration and Script Management. All of them use impulse as their data source. So we needed to have their own migration path for all those customers as well. And then anytime you're switching to a new system, you need to figure out your tools. How do you look at it? How do you debug it? How do you use it? And we had to build some new tools to work on this new Spark-based platform that the Azure team is building. And then finally, what, you know, one of the big challenges is just working with other teams. Our product team had to work with another product team very closely over several years. We had to support each other. We had to work, figure out how to communicate with each other, how to, how to uh, make sure that everything that we were doing was not stomping on each other's toes. Um, and I think that was one of the big uh, uh, reasons for our success is that we end up building a really good relationship with this other internal team um, and we are able to effectively communicate with each other and, and, and um, make it work. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Amir and he's going to talk about uh, what Asgard is. Hi, thank you very much. So what is Asgard? Asgard is a homegrown cloud-based data warehouse. It uh, basically copycats some of the features that has in Snowflake. For example, its deployment model is very similar to the deployment model of Snowflake, where we are using something uh, similar to warehouses with different sizes. We uh, expose the Snowflake-like ingest API, the, if you are familiar with this, copy into, uh, where you put uh, files on the staging area, send a call, which asks to uh, ingest these files, and we fetch them from there. We expose Spark SQL query API. Uh, and uh, even further, we expose an API of Spark SQL to run ETLs on your data inside the data warehouse. Our current infrastructure is AKS, Azure uh, Kubernetes offering, and we are running on top of storage Azure Gen 2. OK, so I guess nobody here thinks that I can go to the open source, download Spark, run it on Kubernetes or wherever, and everything will work like charm because Snowflake would not worth uh, the money she is currently worth if this was the case. Something you need to be behind the scene that create this uh, uh, ability to replace them. So what are the secret sources that uh, uh, make Asgard different and 
uh, fit for this job. We have a customer and enhanced Spark version. We have a unique partitioning model, and we have a state-of-the-art Colonna format. And I will elaborate on them on the next slide. So what is customized and enhanced Spark version? We are basically um, a fork the uh, open source version of Spark, and we change code there. We optimize synchronized block, we optimize data structure, and we open, optimize SQL function. We improve the internal uh, in-memory cache compression. In fact, we managed to improve it between uh, 30 to 50% by changing the internal code of the way that currently uh, in-memory compression is being done in Spark. We improve driver stability protection, uh, meaning, for example, today in Spark, you can limit the amount of uh, uh, data that you receive from a single job, but you cannot limit the amount of data that you receive from multiple jobs. Now, when you are running 60 query per second, you need to protect yourself from a situation where you receive too much information into a driver and basically it causes it to fail. We also find out that drivers are very uh, sensitive for the amount of task that they are receiving. So we monitor the amount of task and do coalesce on the fly when needed. We have a custom strategy, rule, and filter that ena enable us to do better push-down capabilities, leveraging our own proprietary columnar format. We have cache, cache data locality awareness and AZ locality awareness, which is a, a very unique when you are running on Kubernetes, because what the meaning of locality on Kubernetes? Imagine you have a cache on your Kubernetes layer. We know how to uh, uh, make, make sure that your task will run locally where, which where the cache is store, uh, storing a relevant file. What is AZ locality? If somebody uh, have used Azure ever, you know that Azure has uh, different availability zones. You prefer not to cross them, yeah? So how we did it? We take the rec locality feature and expand it to uh, reflect as if it is in a different availability zones, giving us the ability to uh, locate our uh, uh, task closest to our data. We have a unique partitioning model. We are not using Delta Lake, but it's inspired from Delta Lake. We have a, a, a file format that has a footer, and this footer points to the different sections of the file. Each section represents uh, a partition. This do a, uh, uh, basically decoupling the amount of partition that you need to create from the amount of files that you need to create the too many file problem that is very familiar with many systems that are uh, currently running big data. We also have a customized uh, service called MetaService. It exposed to us all our information on the metadata of the files in a SQL manner. And it is able to serve uh, X tens query per second in less than 200 milliseconds per query. And of course, it's very easy to scale it out and uh, accommodate how query, I query rate. And finally, we have our own proprietary state-of-the-art colonel format. We are not, its code name is Padwan. We are not using Parquet, we are not using ORS. And this, uh, uh, this format has several capabilities that no other format currently match. For example, it supports regex and UDF pushdown. It supports built-in pushdown aggregation, you can also push down the list into it. You uh, uh, also support what's called explode pushdown. What is explode pushdown? When you have a nested structure today, in many cases you need to do explode on your data frame. This considers a very heavy operation. So we know how to do it on the file format level. And finally, uh, very in near future, we will have an optimized data encryption, encrypting only the data and not the metadata that she stored as part of the file. In fact, in local benchmark, we saw that the uh, storage footprint of our columnar format is 10 to 15% better than Parquet. It has the same write uh, uh, latency, but between 20 to 80% improvement in query time latency. Now back to you. Thank you, Amir. Um, so yeah, so we've had this amazing platform that we're migrating to, uh, as we're migrating off of Snowflake. It took us a couple years, uh, and we'll go over some of the, the, the benefits of it and some of the challenges, some of the costs that we're in. 
So here's the, here's the, the money stream. So uh, for us, for our, our, our organization, we saved over 10 million a year in savings, 80% uh, cost reduction, migrating office no um, Even better, in my opinion, is the, the performance uh, improvements that we saw from it. You know, as I said, when we started out, we wanted to have equal or better performance uh, on this internal data warehouse. And in user visible workloads, this is users actually interacting with dashboards, we're seeing anywhere from 20 to 80% faster loads of screens. And that's just, that's really good for our customers, right? They, they care about how quickly they can see this data. So on top of the cost savings, uh, we are seeing way better performance, which is just amazing. Um, in addition, working with an internal team, uh, we've been able to adapt a lot of the needs that we've had as a product team uh, for different features that we wanted to build out. They are working closely with us on all these various things that we may not have had that level of support with a public uh, data warehouse. Of course, every migration comes with a cost, right? Uh, this was not for free. Um, it, the migration took us on and off uh, over about three years time to do with a lot of planning, with a lot of testing, with a lot of execution, a migration plan, stage rollouts, et cetera. It took a long time, years to complete. And that has a development cost, of course. Um, on top of that development cost, developer fatigue. Uh, not every developer out there wants to work on a migration for years on end. Um, and so we had a lot of developers that were getting, wanting to build features, but we were having to work on these internal migrations instead, and that can be frustrating. And of course, anytime you're building something internal that you're not, uh, that the customers aren't seeing, that is an opportunity cost for all the things that you could be building. Um, so we could have been building some other features that maybe some of our customers had wanted. And, you know, this is not to say that these costs weren't worth it. They are. Based on the last slide, I would assert we are much happier with where we are. The cost savings, the performance impacts have been amazing. But anytime you're heading into a migration, it's really good to try to understand what the challenges are going to be and what the, those hidden costs, besides just the engineering costs, may be. So given all that, we are now 100% of our data platform for Impulse is on Asgard. We've been running like this for several months. Some of the workloads have been there for over a year. We've had very, very, very good results from a performance impact, from a reliability perspective, and we're very happy with where we're at. Now that we are on this new platform, we see a lot of different ways to continue to optimize. Uh, now that we're working much closer with this team, we're planning the future optimizations that we're gonna do. We're also having the ability to build new features that were not possible for us on Snowflake because of cost. Um, so we have some features that we're rolling out that have been only available because we've migrated and saved costs on this. Um, and then, of course, uh, Akamai uh, purchased Linode um, a while back, uh, and we're going to be migrating a lot of our workloads, um, a lot of the data warehouse over to Linode um, over the next year or so. So that'll be another good cost savings for us as well. Uh, Amir, uh, did you want to talk about any of the... Uh... Yeah, so... Uh, we also basically the, uh, currently the foundation for the migration of Akamai data services into the Linode uh, cloud. Uh, in the future, we are going to support auto-scaling and self-management warehouses, uh, Spark job on demand, and research tools that will be used, the infrastructure that we build uh, uh, for the internal Akamai audience. So... Uh... That is all the content we had today. We would have loved to have much longer presentation and be able to go into some of the technical details. We are more than happy to chat with you about any questions that you have either now or afterward or around, so, uh, or, or after lunch. Uh, you're welcome to hug me. Uh, but thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out and listening to us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you.